most chemists like me don't think all that much about the nucleus of the atoms we do chemistry with. We worry about the electrons because they're involved in the bonds, but the nucleus or the structure of the nucleus usually we don't think about. So as you know, the nucleus of an atom is made up of protons that are positively charged and the number of those protons define which element it is. 10 for neon, 11 for sodium, 12 for magnesium and so on. But the number of neutrons is not fixed in the same way. You can have more neutrons in a nucleus and it's still the same element. Atoms of the same element but with different numbers of neutrons are called isotopes. We have a video about deuterium, the isotope of hydrogen that has one proton and one neutron. Hydrogen normally just has one proton. There's an isotope tritium, weight of three, which has one proton and two neutrons and so on. The really interesting question is, for a given element, what is the maximum number of neutrons that could possibly exist before the nucleus fell apart? I've been helped in this question by our good friend Nagayasu Nawa, who has produced the most wonderful chart. It's too big to show the whole thing. <laughs> wow. Okay, yeah. These grey coloured elements are the ones that we normally see naturally occurring. And the blue ones and the pink ones that have been made synthetically in some way. And the key question for theoreticians is how many neutrons you can add, which physicists call the drip line. I'd never heard of this expression till I read a paper a few days ago. So this is a bit like there's always these record attempts for how many people can you fit in a mini. You also have how many neutrons can you fit in a nucleus? Yes, but there is no theoretical value in knowing how many people you can get into a mini, especially as the mini has got bigger over the years. But knowing the drip line is really quite important for the theory of the nucleus. Some of you will remember that we had a video about this very unusual isotope of calcium called calcium-48 that has 28 neutrons that is particularly stable and can be used for synthesizing all sorts of super heavy elements. I was shown a bottle of calcium-48. It was too valuable for them to allow me to touch it with my shaking hands, but Brady managed to video it. Now, there's a very recent paper here on the discovery of sodium-39. Sodium-39 would be 11 protons, which defines sodium, plus this magic number of 28 neutrons. This would be the heaviest isotope of sodium ever made. People have managed to make sodium-37, but the question was, is that the drip line or could you make a heavier one? It's not easy to make these isotopes. A group in Japan, Riken, and a huge group of researchers, you can see all the authors on the paper, have done experiments where they accelerate calcium-48 ions and collide it with a target of beryllium. This time, instead of trying to add the atomic numbers of the elements together, they're trying to smash things up and look at the atoms that are produced. So over quite a long period of bombardment of beryllium, they managed to observe nine atoms of sodium-39. This is really not a huge number of atoms. So they found it kind of like amongst the debris? They tuned their detector so all the other rubbish that was generated, all the other isotopes, didn't get through to the detector and so they could detect sodium-39. This is quite unusual because previously when we've talked about accelerating calcium, 
it was the light element bashing into something that was really heavy. Now it's reversed. Light element is the target, heavy one is the projectile. Obviously, with nine atoms, this is not of chemical significance, but it is really exciting because it moves the drip line from sodium and shows that the 28 neutrons really does seem to have some magic number. They also found magnesium 40. Magnesium has 12 protons, which will also have the 28 neutrons. But it's not clear whether you could make even heavier magnesium yet. But I think what is really important about this is that there is still an awful lot that we need to learn about the structure of atoms. Getting that information requires really quite complicated equipment, very rare isotopes to use in the experiment, and a huge team of scientists. And modern science is becoming more and more collaborative. Gone are the days where a single scientist can make a wonderful discovery. You need lots of people working together to do it. Do we know what makes a nucleus stable or not stable then? Is it like the geometry of the way it's packed? Is it, is it you know, I look at that thing on your desk there and think, oh, okay, is it, is it, is it the way we arrange all the, all the particles? Or, I mean, why 28? What's, what's going on here? The answer is that I don't know why these things are stable, but there are rival theories which explain the possible stability, and it is observing these very rare isotopes that tells which theories are the ones that are likely to be correct. Of course, there's an awfully long way to go to get through the whole periodic table. The drip line is now probably established to element 11 or perhaps 12, but there's still another many atoms to get to a Ganesson element 118. Glass ampules so that, so that it kind of remains as it is in there. Where do you get all that stuff, Neil? So you can imagine water, which is H2O, 